Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sub-Zero Online 2021. My name is Bill Laboon. I'm the Director of Education and Community at Web3 Foundation, and I am really excited to show you everything that's going to, that is happening right now in the Substrate ecosystem. We have many great presenters from Parity, from Web3, and others developing with Substrate. Before we start, though, I do have a few just housekeeping tips to go over. First, for those of you watching on Hopin, please make sure to go to the reception area if you want to see uh, the schedule for today and tomorrow. As a reminder, today's schedule, there is a, a single track. Uh, however, tomorrow there will be three stages for beginner, intermediate, and advanced. You can always click the stage tab to see uh, the sessions that are currently live. And you can use the Q&A section on the right-hand side of the screen to either ask questions uh, or upvote ones that you would like to see answered. And after the discussions, I will pick some of these questions and ask the presenter. After the presentations, you can go to the Discord with in-depth discussions with speakers, uh, uh, many of the speakers after their presentations or just to discuss uh, other substrate related things. Also on Discord, we've set up a job board. So there are some open positions that you can check out, or if you're a substrate based project, then you can post your own. Finally, uh, as a reminder, during our breaks, uh, there are uh, a few throughout the, uh, uh, throughout Sub-Zero, uh, please feel free to join the speed networking sessions or just sit back and enjoy the music. After the end of the first day, we'll have some swag giveaways during the final networking session uh, at the end of uh, the presentations today. So without any further ado, I would like to present Dr. Gavin Wood. Thank you, uh, Bill. Good. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in. Um, it's uh, still a bit of a shame that we can't all gather in person like the first couple of Sub-Zeros, but, uh, you know, I, I, I have a lot of faith that next year things um, will be a little bit uh, back to how they were. Um, I'm going to use my little uh, bit of time up front to talk to you. Um, I'm going to cover three things. First, I want to just um, uh, reiterate what it is that we're trying to do with Substrate and with um, the parachain model that Substrate was made for. Um, second, I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, what's, uh, what the status is of some of the um, Substrate-related um, uh, projects that Parity is working on. And third, I want to talk um, more broadly about some of the um, currents that we're seeing in the industry at present and how that relates to Substrate and Polkadot. Um, so yeah, let's let's start with a little bit about like what, what Substrate um, and, and particularly um, the parachain model um, is for. I'm, um, this came up um, um, a bit in the last uh, a few months uh, uh, with a um, uh, you know with the, with our industry heating up with a few new projects on the block um, and a clear idea of what it is that substrate gives I think is always worth um, to have in mind. So substrate built power chains um, are really uh, really have these four very important attributes. And we've got to really, uh, I, I want to dig a little bit into each one so that uh, everyone here is very clear about why, why it is um, that, we, uh, that we're doing what we're doing. Um, unstoppable, upgradable, unlimited, and feeler. So let's, let, let's dig in a little bit, unstoppable. So substrate-based power chains and substrate chains in general are uh, crucially they're very decentralized right now we can compare this to a lot of other projects that are not really designed to be that decentralized um, they're designed to be a bit decentralized um, uh, I, I suspect that the project leads often uh, a, a, a sort of uh, uh, trying this hybrid model in order to um, see just how close they can get to um, 
the regulators before uh, uh, they're, they're uh, determined to be just too centralized. But with Substrate, we really want to um, live the, the true peer-to-peer -peer, uh, dream and make um, something that is actually unstoppable, which is why, you know, all of the nodes um, are uh, uh, full nodes sort of have all of the data, why it validators, um, uh, why it's easy to become a validator on a substrate network and why uh, we are dedicating um, a lot of effort to ensuring that light clients are not just viable, uh, but also um, uh, um, um, efficient and performant. So we are trying to achieve scalability with decentralization. We're not going to trade off any decentralization in order to get some um, initial uh, 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 bit of scalability. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is upgradability. Now, most of you will, uh, this will be old news too, but um, I think it's nonetheless very important to uh, emphasize that this is a key feature of Substrate and Polkadot and something that we want to, um, um, uh, we view as being like a, a key part of its mantra and ethos. Um, it's a meta protocol, Substrate chains are meta protocols, Polkadot is a meta protocol being as it's based on a Substrate chain. So this allows us to um, upgrade, update, assimilate new technology very efficiently, very effectively. Um, there's a couple of pictures to try and get this in, <laughs> drive this home, you know. Um, we see a lot of uh, a lot of chains up making those upgrades is a bit like trying to run in, in, in a very muddy field. Um, whereas we get to be the um, illustrated kite surfer. Um, a very important difference of the substrate parachain model is, uh, especially as it's um, it's compared to uh, the smart contract model. And this is some this is a question I get asked about a lot. So it may possibly be a question that that you get asked about with parachain teams and substrate chain teams. So I want to make it super clear: um, the substrate parachain model is a free execution model. This basically means you're leasing out a chunk of time on what amounts to a distributed CPU core. Um, and this is a lot different. This is, this is fundamentally different to what the smart contract gives you, which is a transaction uh, execution model, which is essentially where users um, can pay to have your code executed for them. Um, as a free execution model, you're guaranteed that you get scheduled um, in time slices, and you're guaranteed that that, 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 that scheduling happens at, at um, regular intervals, every six seconds, for example, for Polkadot parachain. Um, and this is crucial in giving you the power and freedom in order to decide how your application should work and implement it as you need to. Um, crucially, you are in control of what transactions get executed, not the other way around. On a smart contract chain, the transactions are in control. And if you can't get that transaction through for whatever reason, or rather not you, but your users, then your application simply won't run. And that can be um, that can make a huge difference as to what applications are actually viable. Um, I mean, the sort of things that a free execution model can give you, you know, go through them, on-chain scheduling, transaction prioritization, ordering, and so forth. Um, in short, facilities like on runtime upgrade, on initialize, on finalize, simply cannot be supported in, a, in, a, in a, an Ethereum style smart contract system. And that's something that you really can get um, very easily in Substrate. Finally, feeless. Now, this, this isn't quite what it's in, because of course, a lot of Substrate chains have these. Um, but it, it comes in two um, key points. The first one is that as a Substrate based power chain, once, once your chain has secured um, a, a parachain slot lease, then you do not have to expose the DOT token or the KSM token, or indeed any token, to your users. Now, of course, most teams will have their own tokens that they want to use in order to um, charge users transaction fees, and that's fine. But in principle, it's entirely uh, your, your chain's decision. Um, you do not need to expose users to any uh, transaction fees at all. In principle, you can um, you can restrict your um, user transactions to you know, some number, uh, some manageable amount for your chain, um, without uh, bringing tokens in at all. You could have, um, for example, certif certification of users. Um, you could have an oracle that checks that uh, you know, the user has a 
sufficient, you know, has, has a sufficient degree of individuality that they won't be able to civil attack and therefore uh, DOS your chain. Um, there are ways of doing this, and this opens the door to feeless applications running on parachains. And that is a, um, a very interesting path indeed, because in my mind, that would uh, uh, open the door to uh, mass, um, uh, mass appeal. At the moment, we can only really appeal to people who don't mind owning tokens or already have some. And that's, I think, quite a limiting factor. Okay, so that's um, broadly speaking how I see um, Substrate and Polkadot the Parachain model B uh, deliver some um, really crucial and fundamental differences. Um, the next thing I want to talk a bit about is uh, just talk, uh, the the status of some. Um, uh, parts of, uh, of uh, substrate relevant technologies. This is, uh, forgive me, this is actually not that much to do with substrate per se. This is more to do with polka dot, but I figure uh, most of the people here won't mind too much. Um, first thing I want to talk about is the uh, status of the bridges, very relevant for substrate projects. This will allow substrate teams to uh, connect their solo chains between each other and also um, if for whatever reason, um, they are um, uh, uh, not uh, planning on getting a parachain slot just yet. It could also provide connectivity, um, admittedly less secure and a bit more latent, but connectivity to the relay chains. Um, bridges are also a very important um, piece of technology for some, uh, some stuff that we want to get done next year, but um, now is not quite the point to talk about that. So the bridges status, um, the bridge audit um, is uh, 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 about two weeks from uh, being uh, completed um, without uh, very many um, uh, issues uh, being found at all. Uh, this is actually, I believe, the second audit. The first one was done some months back. So this is basically the audit of the, of the corrections. Um, there will be a, a bridge being deployed soon uh, from uh, uh, Rokoko to the um, bridge testnet Wokoko, uh, just to uh, make sure that, that works. But we do expect a relay to relay chain bridge deploying before the end of the year, Polkadot and Kusama. Um, that assumes, of course, that the last two weeks of the audit don't bring in any um, more uh, significant issues, but uh, that's the expectation. And uh, the parachain to parachain bridge, hopefully deploying early next year. Um, there will be an additional um, information on this a bit later on uh, in the conference, I believe, but um, yeah, there's the summary. Um, next thing is the XCM status. Um, so uh, XCM v2 is uh, delivered. It's part of Polkadot 0911. Um, this brings in most of what, um, most of the core features of what we've been asked for. Um, Asynchronous error handling. So basically, uh, this this means that you can get uh, you can have some on chain code run in case of um, some error that happens on a remote chain, um, and it's done in a relatively nice way. So it's all done with dispatchables. Um, status reporting. So allowing um, the uh, status of some XCM instruction to be reported back to some other chain, which presumably will want to um, register it with some code handler. Um, asset trapping, uh, which is um, essentially just remembering the contents of the holding register uh, at, the end of, at the end of an XCM message. Um, a lot of the time an XCM, whether it's through an error or just accidentally uh, with perhaps a message that wasn't crafted properly, um, uh, at the end of the message execution, some assets are left in the holding register. This allows for those to be um, uh, uh, remembered and then later claimed. Exception handling, there's now exception handling actually built into the language model of XCM. Um, we're now using a virtual machine model. It's uh, a bit more, um, I think, comprehensible and extensible than before. Uh, and uh, one of the big ones is it's got um, version uh, management. So this allows um, different uh, XCM versions to coexist within um, a multi-chain network. I've also done the specification for version two as well. Uh, next 
is the status of the power chains. Um, I know uh, this is um, of, of importance to many of you here. Um, power chains, uh, the power chain code is now considered feature complete in that all of the security mechanisms from um, the uh, Polkadot uh, spec are implemented, uh, tested, um, and audited. Uh, so yes, the audit's complete. The corrections from the audit are halfway done, expected to be finished uh, by November. And we do expect a initial deployment of this feature complete security code uh, onto Kasama um, uh, uh, very quickly. And we want to leave it three weeks before we, uh, we would want to see it in production, but we don't expect any significant problems. Um, so uh, that should give some uh, idea of the timeline that we would expect before the um, uh, before we expect any power chains to go live on Polkadot. Um, in terms of our opinion on um, on the production um, uh, uh, status of this code, uh, we think uh, it's reasonable to be confident. Um, that parachains be technologically viable from December. And uh, we think a, uh, a deployment to Kosama by the end of October is uh, something that we should expect. And so from a technological perspective, I think it's not unreasonable for Polkadot to begin preparations for the uh, lease period six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 um, uh, for that uh, batch of auctions to begin uh, uh, being prepared for um, uh, more or less now. Uh, we think an ongoing auction schedule will be sensible. Um, we think uh, the number of parachains on Polkadot should remain uh, um, up to only three quarters of what's on Kusama. Um, in order to keep Kusama as Polkadot's canary network, at least until the code is mature and we have a, a much better idea about um, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, amount of, uh, of, of uh, parachains and transactional throughput and message throughput that it can handle on the current infrastructure. Um, we think shorter auctions um, for the uh, initial um, uh, parachain scale-up period would not be unreasonable. Uh, in general, we would stick to um, what we've already uh, was published in the uh, in the past, so a roughly two week um, per auction schedule. Good. And uh, looking forward, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the currents and trends. Um, not very many, actually, only a couple um, in the uh, industry as a whole and how it relates to what we're doing with Substrate, uh, what we're working on, and what you can expect from us over the course of the next 12 months or so. Um, one thing that I've, I've noticed is that in the search for uh, high transactional throughput, um, there are quite a few chains that have lost sight of the fact that decentralization, um, and for that matter, security, are not optional features. Right? Um, you can get a lot more transaction throughput if you're willing to trade off um, um, the effective decentralization of your network, if you're willing to trade off um, the peer-to-peer -peer, um, aspects of your network. Um, there's a reason that Ethereum 2 is taking so long. Actually, there are several reasons. Uh, one of them is that they're doing it. Um, they're not willing to trade off, as we are not, um, the, the decentralization aspects of the network. And if you're not willing to do that, then the architecture, the design, um, particularly out of the security, has to be um, a lot more thought through. So when you see networks claiming large TPS that are supposedly public networks, um, I would take uh, any comparisons with uh, quite a lot of salt. <laughs> and um, oftentimes, uh, it's really not an apples for apples comparison. If we look at the currents of uh, the global regulation, we can see uh, a few things. Now, I've read a couple a couple of reports about this. Um, I don't claim to be an expert. I certainly don't claim to be a lawyer. 
But there are some things that crop up in these reports and these policy statements um, that seem, uh, in in my mind, to make some sense. Um, if we look at the FATF, which is an, an international body, it's um, roughly the, the G20, I believe, of nations uh, that, that, that get their heads together or give some faceless bureaucrats and get their heads together. Um, we see some, some fairly, if, if we look at what they're saying, we see some fairly uh, clear policy. Um, the good news is that software development and generic um, uh, keeping, um, so maintaining of a network, is, um, is considered something that, that oh, untouchable, is considered something that, that should be allowed to, 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 to continue. Uh, without any any regulation at all, and this is a good thing, right? Because this is uh, this is our bread and butter as developers and uh, and, and people who want to uh, deploy these kinds of peer to peer networks. Um, it, it's crucial that these activities remain um, free and unfettered. However, it's also pretty clear that um, uh, global regulators are um, uh, uh, taking a very critical eye to some other things that. Um, uh, uh, that I think most peer-to-peer, -peer, most decentralized projects have at least dabbled in a bit, uh, many of which uh, rely very uh, distinctly on some of these. Uh, one is service provision. Um, this is basically RPCs, wallets, um, app sites. Another is um, 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 uh, multi-sigs. So like uh, DAOs are, are often um, sort of named um, example of this. Uh, where you've got like a, a bunch of um, like named personnel who can decide how to spend the DAO's treasury. This is also the case with Polkadot Osama. Custodians, hosted wallets, and uh, non peer to peer stable coins um, being the obvious two. And also, it seems easy fire is what I've called here, but basically, um, apps, wallets that are trying to use it, utilizing centralized um, uh, mechanisms, trying to make um, decentral the decentralized apps easier to use and I think these um, probably one of the later things that these will still uh, from what I'm reading come under some scrutiny um, the service provision is is one of the more most interesting ones because of course decentralized networks that um, that are I would say fairly legitimately peer-to-peer -peer, such as ethereum still make a heavy reliance on centralized RPC services um, and oftentimes centralized wallets and, and, uh, and, and sites to host decentralized applications. And I think these, um, certainly looking at the language that is being used by global regulators, it seems that these will come under uh, substantial scrutiny in the not too distant future. Um, one thing I think is certain, the more centralized you are, the more chance you have of regulators uh, knocking at your door, insisting that you become licensed. And uh, the more peer-to-peer, -peer, then the lower the chance. So um, pushing towards peer-to-peer -to -peer seems reasonable. Um, another thing I think that it's quite likely, again, reading some of these documents, um, it seems that crypto projects that are not sufficiently peer-to-peer, -peer, that are deemed sufficiently centralized, will probably um, require um, uh, licensing. And those licensing requirements, I would expect, will be of the similar Kind of standard to banking requirements. This, if this is true, this would imply that most crypto projects in their current form may not actually be able to exist in the uh, in the next uh, year or two. I mean, I think the timeline for this is probably um, uh, two to three years before it gets properly enforceable. But still, um, it's it's good to plan for the future, especially when the technology that you need to mitigate these um, risks is. Um, is quite difficult to implement. At Parity, we are committed to peer-to-peerifying everything. We want to make sure that our technology is in line with what is considered uh, not needed for regulation. And this means that um, we have a lot of emphasis uh, now, but also going forward on, um, on these um, 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 what I would call almost like uh, weak points within um, decentralization, particularly bootstrapping, boot nodes, point of, the, point of centralization there. RPC nodes, also a point of centralization. We're managing that with 
um, with like clients and particularly in browser like clients, which I hope um, we're going to have a, a nice introduction to you all for in this very conference. Um, with governance, particularly um, uh, trying to ensure that we can have on chain decentralized governance um, that, um, uh, that doesn't fall foul of any kind of um, uh, potential multi sig regulations and also privacy, so privacy mechanisms such as MixNet. One thing that I want to uh, make very clear is that solutions that are built on Substrate um, should be true Web3 solutions, so actually peer-to-peer. -peer. And similarly, um, for Polkadot, we want that to be the first peer-to-peer, -peer, secure, and scalable free execution platform. And with that, I just want to leave you with the four uh, tenets of um, uh, polka dot power chains and substrate chains, unstoppable, upgradable, unlimited, and feedless. Thank you very much. That was my keynote. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that was very interesting. And we have quite a few questions uh, from the audience if you have some time. Um, so, uh, first sure. on so this last. Yeah, so first on this last topic about regulation, uh, do you see risks to developers uh, and you know, like centralized solutions for development such as GitHub uh, for these projects, or do you see it that at a different level? Um, I think centralized solutions that are very clearly um, geared towards general development are probably not going to have much of an issue. Um, I don't think they're going to start. I don't think regulation is is going to start coming in against like the Rust language because the Rust language happens to be used for substrate. Um, I do think that um, I, I I I I'll continue on that thread. I also don't think that teams that engage purely in um, in technological development, so basically in coding, software development, um, and uh, and software releases, I also I don't think are going to be a, a big target anytime soon, I would hope indefinitely. But I do think that uh, any service provision that is to do with um, uh, transaction uh, facilitation, not just processing, um, could become a target, could come under scrutiny. And um, therefore, it's important to um uh to try to minimize um the degree to which we as teams operating in the space have any significant control over the transactions um and the use of um uh of, of any uh, value that exists within our uh, networks okay uh, thank you. Um, a couple of other questions. Uh, two, actually, that we had that would just like to clarify some of the the, the things that you mentioned. Uh, so you had mentioned uh, lease periods six through nine, um, but I think uh, some people didn't understand how lease periods work. Could you just uh, uh, go over what that what that means exactly? Sure. It actually, it's uh, that was the typo. It should actually be six through thirteen. Um, but yeah, um, the, the lease periods um, are uh, essentially time slots um, for parachains. So um, uh, each lease period on Polkadot is three months. And um, uh, we are currently, at, uh, as it happens, we're, we're, I think we're just um, approaching the uh, uh, midpoint of lease period five. Uh, we should be, uh, lease period five should be ending and lease period six should be beginning around the uh, middle of December. And um, we think that basically the middle of December would be a not unreasonable point um, to uh, to have um, uh, uh, from a technological point of view to have parachains uh, be uh, 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 be live on Polkadot. I mean, we would actually say probably early December, but um, uh, but as it happens, mid December uh, would not be. Uh, we think a Bad plan. Okay. Um, also, one of your slides you had mentioned both uh, re excuse me relay to relay bridges as well as parachain mm -hmm. to para, you know para to para bridges. Uh, so, is this mm -hmm. using XCM? Is this is this something different? Like, how would this differ? Like, a bridge between a parachain and a parachain differ from uh, using XCM, or is that actually you know part of the same 
uh, uh, thing. Um, so uh, XCM is a message format, and this as a message format should be usable regardless of the transport mechanism. Um, so uh, XCM is usable both for communicating upwards to a relay chain, downwards from a relay chain to a power chain, sideways uh, using XCMP from power chain to power chain. Um, and also over bridges, which is another transport mechanism. Um, the uh, the relay to relay bridge is a uh, is essentially just saying that there would be um, actually on the relay chain itself a pallet that allowed the relay chain to send messages to another relay chain. Um, now these messages would be pretty secure. <laughs> um, but uh, in principle, uh, we may have, uh, you know, they're not, they're never going to be as secure as um, parachain to parachain within the same uh, relay chain network, just because they have actually the same sovereignty, the same consensus mechanism, uh, the same um, uh, 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 securing um, uh, capital. Um, when I mentioned the uh, parachain to parachain uh, bridging, what this is, what this means is that the bridge would sit from a parachain on Polkadot to a parachain on Kusama. So it's still bridging Polkadot and Kusama, but it's doing so without um, interfering with the uh, relay chain itself. It's doing it all within the, um, uh, the confines of a single parachain. Um, and eventually this, this would obviously be a, a system parachain or a common good parachain. Um, and it would, uh, uh, in principle, should be able to uh, hold more than one bridge. Um, it's, uh, the general idea is that we would have a bridge hub um, that would sit in this common good parachain um, bridging over to uh, not just um, Polkadot to Kusama, but also Polkadot to uh, many other networks. And uh, similarly on the Kusama side, from Kusama to networks beyond Polkadot. Okay, yeah, bringing that, uh, that vision of a uh, multi-chain world uh, to, to fruition. Um, so uh, another uh, question we had is, what is going to be the focus uh, on substrate development uh, over the next uh, you know, year or so? I know we've seen, uh, I know we're going to see a lot of things that people are working on, but would you say there are particular areas of focus uh, that you're working on? Yeah, so um, the, the main things I think uh, um, that we're gonna see are uh, in terms of like a, a renewed focus, obviously there, there are bridges, there's the, um, um, that's the content continuation of some of the frame um, um, stuff, in particular upgrades and migrations. Um, but um, a renewed focus will be placed on um, substrate and its peer-to-peer -peer decentralization um, technologies. Uh, in particular, um, ensuring that we have the right governance apparatus to be able to have um, uh, agile, um, efficient, inclusive, accessible governance without relying on um, on centralizing mechanisms like um, like the council and potentially even like the technical committee. So I think uh, one of the one of the things that we're going to see over the next twelve months is um, a uh, evolution and iteration in the governance building blocks that Substrate provides. A second thing would be the light client. Um, um, I, I don't know. Uh, many of you may or may not be aware of the. Um, small dot um, uh, project, which uh, aims to be a substrate light client um, that is uh, uh, very uh, efficient and very nippy. It can uh, be compiled into WebAssembly and sit um, uh, quite happily within a browser window. Um, we'll also be um, uh, focusing on one of the sort of newer projects um, yet to be uh, commissioned, but soon. Um, will be uh, the initial bootstrapping and discovery so that we can find boot nodes for a substrate chain without having to have them hard coded into the code base. Um, and one other um, initiative that, I, uh, that I'm quite excited about next year, um, it's not strictly the substrate feature or code base, but is a substrate and uh, polka dot centric education program. Um, that's uh, something that's in its early phases at the moment, uh, but um, I would hope that um, over the next 12 months, uh, we have um, really uh, uh, a, a very uh, a world standard, gold standard education program for people 
who want to uh, really get to grips with um, substrate and Polkadot, parachains, blockchain technology in general, crypto, um, game theory, um, and Rust. Um, and this is, uh, I think, something that, um, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've obviously got some things already in the ecosystem, but this would really be the, um, um, uh, the icing on top of the cake. Yeah, I, I'm very curious just to follow up on that. Do you have any ideas about some of these new uh, governance primitives, uh, these decentralizing governance primitives? Or this is still this is the very early phases uh, of thinking about that? Uh, no, uh, indeed, there is uh, uh, very much some ideas. And this is something that um, I, I wouldn't want to say that we are um, at the point immediately before implementation. Uh, where we have a very coherent design but we're also i would say um a fair um, we have fairly fleshed out ideas uh one of the um I, I think actually the main idea is to try to follow a more liquid democracy model um where we have um uh where we emphasize vote delegation which is in effect what the council is doing anyway right um so uh, in addition, and, and it's also technology that we already have implemented. You can already delegate votes, but we would, I think, try to make it so that vote delegation is uh, much more um, agile, uh, meaning that you wouldn't have to uh, manually undelegate before you're able to uh, move funds and you wouldn't uh, necessarily have to pay anything to delegate. Um, secondly, uh, uh, and and in addition, you know, so sort of building on this um, on this delegation to try to get people um, involved in in the general uh, referendum model would be to move beyond the adaptive quorum biasing and move beyond the fixed um, uh, fixed time with potential fast tracking model that we have now into a um, a variable time limit uh, mechanism with a um, essentially allowing referenda to end early if they have a sufficiently high turnout and are sufficiently uh, in favor or against. So essentially, um, you know, for a referendum to end within an hour, there would have to be an exceptionally high turnout and exceptionally biased towards um, approve or reject um, within that turnout. But as time goes on, we would accept a lower turnout and a bit of a less of a bias one way to the other um, in order to allow for the early, yeah, early uh, uh, ending of the uh, referendum, and then the idea is that if it if it played through and, and had the, like the entire um, whatever two weeks uh, or, or or a month or, or however long it's meant to go for by default, and still hadn't sort of early exited, then it would exit without um, uh, without anything happening. So it would essentially fail. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, like you. Know, removing any you know individuals or like more uh uh yeah uh, that there's some yeah, really interesting plans uh for governance uh thank you uh so so this is an interesting question it's 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 kind of vague though uh so i guess you can take it however you want uh, but you know what are some ways that individuals can help you know, increase this decentralization and help uh you know promote substrate and the technological adoption of you know, the polka dot ecosystem like, what would you give um, as advice think, for people who want that? Yeah, it's it's hard uh, without knowing the specific skill set of any given individual. Um, if they are, uh, you know, a great coder, then uh, lending a hand either to the uh, core technology within Substrate uh, or to um, uh, building great products on Substrate. Um, if they're not not maybe so much of a coder, uh, but but you know, sort of a good networker, which uh, meets a lot of people, do a lot of talking, then um, presenting on the key differences, um, evangelism, going to other developers and, and, and letting them know, right, well, this is why Substrate's a good idea, this is why Polkadot is different, um, I think is crucial. Um, uh, and generally, if, if they're non-technical, uh, entirely non-technical, then uh, just general evangeli uh, evangelization of, uh, sorry, evangelism, of uh, peer to peer decentralized uh, decentralization in, uh, as, a, as a whole. So, like, why is decentralization a good thing? Why is doing things in a peer to peer fashion a good thing? Why do we not want to have the trust authorities? Why do we, uh, what's, what's the problem with authorities? You know, talking about um, 
uh, necklaces of power, talking about the potential for corruption, the potential for mistakes to have magnifying effects than the greater the uh, centralization is. And this is stuff that isn't specifically to do with technology. This is just stuff, this is like, you know, classic um, uh, um, uh, sociology almost. It's like why, uh, why it's not such a great thing to place so much power into the hands of so few. Um, and uh, the, I, I think you know, if you if you Google for um, uh, decentralization and, 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 and social democracy and so on, you will probably find quite a lot of material. In this. Yeah. All right. Well, th thank you very much. That was a, a great speech and some uh, great uh, answers uh, to questions. Uh, so we are out of time for this. Uh, so, so thank you uh, once again. And uh, thank you, we Bill. will be yep. And we will be back in just a few minutes. Thank you.